That's great. Oh Lord, we pray that you would uh, speak to us today. We are here, ready to hear, and we ask that you would give us openness and attentiveness, that you would help us to understand things that are difficult, and that by hearing your word, your living word, we will be brought closer to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to remind you, uh, you that uh, we're, we're looking at uh, communion uh, each month. We celebrate communion once a month, and each month we're looking at communion through a different lens, through a different kind of metaphor. Because the sacrament of communion is not one thing, it's many things. And so each month we're kind of taking a different angle on it. And today we're looking at it as remembering, an act of remembering. And memory is one of the things that makes us human, isn't it? 1,500 years ago, St. Augustine marveled at what he called the storehouse of the human memory, where we keep countless thoughts and images and ideas and experiences that we can call forth as we need them, and in so doing, actually bring the past back to life in the present. Now, as you get older, sometimes they don't come back as quickly as you might like, but Augustine said, this is truly an amazing thing, the human memory. And Augustine took memory as one piece of evidence that we really are created in the image of God, because God has endowed us with this ability. The thing is, though, human beings are not the only creatures who have memories, are they? We don't have a dog in our house anymore, but I remember when we did, uh, I remember what would happen when our dog heard even the faintest jingle of the chain at the end of her leash, she would begin to leap and dance around in paroxysms of joy because that jingling to her meant one thing and one thing only, we're going for a walkie. <laughs> she remembered that sound and knew that she associated it with going for a walk. On a much less pleasant note, once we had rats in our garage, I hate to say it, but it's true, we had an infestation of rats in our garage. And so we called the exterminator, he came and shut up all the places where they were getting in, and he told us to clean up everything in the garage that might attract them, and he found holes in the garden where they had burrowed, and he put poison down the holes, but he said, you know, if you have rats, one of the most important things to do is to move stuff around, because rats have incredible memories, and if they once follow a certain path that leads to food, that memory is indelibly imprinted in their minds, and they'll follow it again and again. So if the rat follows that familiar path, but nothing is where it's supposed to be, it gets anxious and leaves and goes somewhere else. At least that's the hope. <laughs> so, you know, we're not the only creatures with memories. But what then is the difference between our human memory and our dog's memory, or a rat's memory, for that matter? Is there a difference? Well, I think it's this. When human beings remember things, they make stories out of them. It's not just the memory of where to find food or a kind of instinctive memory of a pleasant or unpleasant experience, like when it's time to go for a walk. We take our memories and we fashion them into meaningful narratives. With our memories, we make sense out of our lives. Memories are not just a series of disjointed events, are they? We recall them in such a way that they tell us who we are, where we came from, where we belong, and where we dream that we might go. Memories are the raw material that we fashion into a living history. And that's what I think makes our memories probably different from another, another animal's. The thing about memories, though, which we all know from experience, is that they tend not to last. In time, sometimes quite quickly, they fade. I think when you go to a cemetery, it's kind of sad to see an inscription on a gravestone that says, always remembered, always remembered. Because it's not really true, is it, that the person in that grave is always remembered. We like to think it's true, and it gives us comfort to believe it's so, but cemeteries are full of people that nobody remembers anymore. 
And if you go to an old cemetery, you'll find that even the, grave, even the names on the gravestones have been uh, rubbed off by the weather so that we don't even know who it is that's buried there. We can hold on to memories for a while, but then they recede and most of our memories die with us. If we're going to keep hold of memories, particularly from one generation to the next, we need to be intentional about it. We need to actually do something that will preserve those memories. That's why people establish memorials to their loved ones in churches, like we have on our walls here, and uh, in other public buildings, it's so that they won't be forgotten after the people who actually knew them are no longer around to remember them. When my wife and I were in Germany five years ago, we saw something that I just found incredibly moving. It was a display in a subway station in Berlin that had photographs and brief biographies of Jewish children who had perished in the Holocaust. Now the aim of the Nazis who killed them was not just to obliterate them, but also to wipe out their memory. The Nazis believed that the world would be a better place not only if they got rid of all the Jews, but actually got rid of the memory that they had ever existed. And so one of the ways to honor those who died is simply to keep their names and their memories alive in a public way. Today we read the end of the story of Noah and the flood where God put that rainbow in the sky. And the point of the rainbow is to remember. Remarkably, not only that Noah's descendants would remember, but also that God would remember the covenant between God and the earth. God said, when I see that bow in the sky, I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember my covenant never to destroy the earth again with a flood. Later on, when the people of Israel were commanded to observe the Sabbath as a day of rest, God said, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. The reason you're going to keep that day of rest is so that you will have a weekly reminder that you are not slaves anymore and of the God who set you free. And so when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, he wasn't just telling us to call something to mind. He was saying, do something. Do something concrete and tangible and intentional that will keep that memory alive and through that memory keep you connected to me. The thing is, though, not all memories are good, are they? Some things we would rather forget. Some memories actually drag us down. We can't, get, we can't let go of them. We can't get them out of our heads as much as we try, and they begin to eat away at us from the inside. You know, it's good to remember our loved ones, but sometimes those memories can be like a raw wound that just won't heal. Everywhere we turn, there are painful reminders of that loss. People tell me sometimes that they just cannot come back to church after the funeral of a loved one because it just brings all of that painful stuff flooding back. Remembering the past gives us a sense of rootedness, but memories of the past can also be forged into chains that bind us. And that's what's going on in a lot of churches these days. People have all these wonderful memories of the good old days when the church was bursting and the Sunday school was full and life was beautiful. But these memories actually keep them from facing present reality and accepting the fact that it's not 1962 any longer. Memories are really important for giving us a sense of belonging, but those same memories can feed clan and race hatreds. Memories of the past, of past wrongs, can keep conflicts and feuds going for centuries. In August 1914, in the early days of World War I, the Germans surrounded the Russian 6th Army, which was about 60,000 men, surrounded them and destroyed that army at what, was, what became known as the Battle of Tannenberg, Tannenberg being a town in what was then East Prussia. The thing is that that battle didn't actually take place at Tannenberg. It wasn't really anywhere close to Tannenberg, so why did they call it that? Well, they called it that because in 1410, the year 1410, a Slavic army had defeated a German army, and the memory of that humiliation was still fresh in the German imagination 500 years later. And so the leader said, you know, we're going to call this the Battle of Tannenberg, because we're going to make a statement that that 500-year-old defeat is now reversed. 
So our memories can actually imprison us in the past and keep us from moving forward, can't they? At the same time, isn't it so true that remembering can set us free? When I remember how I was able to face and conquer a problem in the past, it can give me the strength and courage to face a problem in the present. When I remember what it was first like to fall in love with my wife, it can warm my love for her in the present today. When I remember the sacrifices that people have made for me, it moves me to sacrifice myself for others. And when I remember the lengths to which God was willing to go to find me and bring me home, it motivates me to want to serve God with my life. So when we come to this table here, and we break bread, and we pour wine, and we repeat Jesus' words, do this in remembrance of me, we're not just calling to mind some dry and dusty ancient history lesson. We're participating in a living reality through our act of remembering. The reason Jesus is present in the bread and wine is that we also remember that he rose from the dead, and he went to be with God, and he lives there now, and that he's present among us who are gathered here in his name. There's one more sense of the word remember that I also think is significant, and that is remembering in the sense of remembering, or in other words, putting back together, reassembling, the opposite of dismembering, if you will. We're reminded that remembering is what we do when we come together in a community. This aspect of remembering was driven home to me when I read something written by the noted atheist Christopher Hitchens. Uh, now, I don't normally pay a whole lot of attention to what Christopher Hitchens writes, but I found this excerpt from his memoir incredibly moving. He wrote, I once spoke to someone who had survived the genocide in Rwanda, and she said to me that there was now nobody left on the face of the earth, either friend or relative, who knew who she was. No one who remembered her girlhood and her early mischief and family lore. No sibling or boon companion who could tease her about that first romance. No lover or pal with whom she could reminisce. All her birthdays, exam results, illnesses, friendships, kinships, gone. So this was something who, this is someone rather who survived physically, and yet something terribly precious was lost from her forever because there was no one left who remembered her. I get to spend a lot of time with families who come together for funerals. And a lot of what people do when they assemble from all the far-flung places where they live is to remember. And it's kind of like death threatens to tear a hole in the fabric of our family community. And the way we can stand against that and its disintegrating power is by remembering. Maybe they haven't seen each other for months or even years, but in that time of remembering, they're reconstituted as a family. They're reconstituted as those connected through the one who has died. Through their memories, they are literally remembered. And I want you to think about that in terms of what we do here in the church. We come from all the places where we have been scattered. And we come together both to remember, but also to be remembered in Jesus' name. Jesus said we're to be his body in the world, and that each one of us is a member of that body. When we remember, we're not just in touch with our own personal thoughts or feelings, not even just with the people that are sitting around us here in this church on Sunday morning. We're connected to all God's people everywhere. When we remember Jesus, we are also remembered by Jesus. We're joined together into his body, so that we can be His presence in the world. And so that's what we're going to do today at this table. We're going to remember, but we're also going to be remembered as the body of Christ. Amen. Thanks be to God.